Hello and welcome back to Watch Box Reviews here in Philadelphia and the Northeast generally. The weather outside is frightful, but inside the watches are so delightful and you thought we were out of season. The bottom line is that tonight we've got some of the best watches from the biggest brands in high horology and free stuff to give away. For those of you who are new to the program, Watches Live is a tour de jour of the watches that pique my interest and might pique yours while I give away free things. For example, branded hats from some of our favorite brands and I've actually got a blue Italian leather Panerai wallet for some lucky soul tonight. All you have to do to get free stuff delivered on my dime is send to Tim at thewatchbox.com your name, your phone number, and your physical mailing address because remember, I can't email you free swag. All right, let's see who's joining us online right now. I can see into the chat box come our friends from around the world. And folks, by the way, you don't have to be in the United States to win free stuff. Matt Foster joining us, ST3, Adam J. Odell. I can see Fabi Schwartz, Russell996, a Porsche enthusiast after my own heart. Paul A., Todd Piasecki, I like watches, CRJ, Uptick Watch Reviews, and Simon Holt, welcome aboard. I'm gonna pick our first winner of the night. Okay, first fellow to take home swag is going to be Bennett Barnett of Virginia. Congratulations, Bennett, you just won yourself a Tag Heuer commemorative fan hat. Whether you're into tag or you're more a Hoyer type guy, you're going to be ready to stand trackside at Virginia International Raceway for motorsports events this year with this handsome tag Hoyer themed motorsports enthusiast watch cap. Congratulations, man. I'm going to send this to you in Virginia. Okay, friends and family, mostly friends. I know my mom's in there somewhere. Joining us, Andrew ST12. I can see we also have Fjord Prefect and Watch Lover in Hawaii, a previous winner. Okay, let's get started with some watches tonight. Let's go whole hog. Guys, at the top of the tech tree, you're looking at a combination of watchmaking, engineering, finish, status, standing, and history that is going to be worthy of top dollar. But what happens when an upstart channels the spirit of heritage in a package that's anything but traditional. Well, back in 2004, Central City, Philadelphia, guys, got to put up with the neighbors outside. In 2004, Roger Dubuis of Geneva went where none had gone before, an ultra haute de gamme sports watch with the most classical, traditional, and beautifully intricate Geneva Hallmark standard of finish on a movement drawn from the annals of the greats. This is the same Le Mans 2310 Abouche that goes into the Patek Philippe 5070 as the CH 2770. Geneva Hallmark Cote de Genève black polished swan's neck regulator and screw heads, black polished cap to a column wheel with a traditional lateral clutch column wheel chronograph architecture, and yes, it bears the storied Poisson de Genève. So in a 300 meter diver, like I said, big, boisterous, and with a golden bronze dial, beautifully rose lathe cut, completely unprecedented, except for the movement. Here is the Patek Philippe 5070. It's the exact same Le Mans 2310 Abouche, beating away at the same lazy 18,000 vibrations per hour, bearing the same blazing straight grain finish, Cote de Genève, black polish, and gorgeous mirrored anglage. 48 hour power reserve in both, Breguet overcoil in both. Which one do you choose? This is the beginning of tonight's versus theme, where we're taking things that are sometimes related, sometimes diametrically opposed, and we're comparing them. Guys, obviously Patek Philippe has the patrimony, but remember, Dubuis was once a complications engineer and lead watchmaker for Patek Philippe. So this, in a very real sense, comes from this. Guys, this watch was called Just for Friends. 888 made, 46 millimeters in hand-finished stainless steel. Which one of you guys out there would take this over something like an Hublot Big Bang or an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore? Or hey, let's go crazy, a Richard Mill RM28 or RM32? Tell me in the chat box right now. And remember, send your name, phone number, and email to, and I, or I mean physical mailing address, because I can't email you the swag. I take that back. Name 
phone number and physical email to Tim at the watch box. If you've already entered, you're already in. If you've entered in the past, you're already in. If you're not in the US, you can still win. And yes, if you're watching this recorded, still send your email because I'll draw from the pool I have, which is recent entries and past contestants. Okay. Jordan A. joining us, Miami in the house. Wrist, welcome. Wrist cuckoo, welcome. You are absolutely a man after my own heart. Both of these fellows from South Florida. And Colin Chen joining us bright and early in Singapore, where our ownership is based and where it is morning. Welcome. Welcome, Colin. All right, folks. So you've seen our first verses of the night. Some say that a house divided against itself cannot stand in civil war. But if you're Rolex, you believe in strength in numbers, which is why I give you two separate versions of the legendary Rolex Oyster Perpetual Daydate. Now, the watch you see in rose gold is, what, is what's known as the 118205. Ever rose, rose gold, 36 millimeters. This is the traditional Daydate that we've known and loved since roughly 1955. And right across from it, in platinum is the spectacular Date 840-228-206 with a laser-cut cross-hatch engraved dial. This debuted at Basel World 2015. Let's start with the traditional and then let's move on to the hyper-modern. Okay, first I want to talk to you about this 118205. Now there's a couple of features that really set this apart and make it a bit unusual by the standard of 36 millimeter Date 8s. First, Look at the bracelet. It's the three-link Rolex Oyster like you see on a sports watch. It's not the triple-link, small-link President. So compare the President bracelet right here in platinum to what you have here, which is a handsomely finished red gold oyster. This is a burlier, more masculine, more visually massive and insistent look. This is a bit more classical for a day date. Whoever ordered this watch wanted to get as many differentiating factors as possible, and the bracelet is only the beginning of those factors. Now you will note it still has the traditional crown clasp. It doesn't have a bulky oyster dive clasp. It's still low in profile, still very discreet about its partition point, but take a look at the bezel on this one. We're used to seeing a fluted bezel on gold Rolex watches. Here it's domed in spite of the fact that it's red gold and turn it over and you have a spectacular pink metallic sunburst. Why do I call it pink? Because that's Rolex's word to describe it. They call this pink. It's somewhere between red and salmon. It has tinges of copper and it's a beautiful complement to the high platinum content, high copper content ever rose alloy used to make the case. You'll also note the presence of large and bold diamond polished red gold, uh, I should say Roman numerals here. Many different features, the numerals, the bezel, the dial, and the bracelet. This one is anything but standard. I will say what's inside is very much standard and it's the caliber 3155 chronometer grade double quick set automatic. Now, 100 meters water resistant right there. My friends down in Miami who are contacting me in the chat box and giving me the shout out, you can see I'm in a Miami mode tonight with my sunglasses and my bleached white shirt. This is a perfect watch for Miami Beach. Now, where I am right now, Philadelphia, we're more of a New York, Chicago, Philly sensibility. Well, what does that mean? Well, for us, it means we're going with white metals. We're going with white metals, and in this case, the king of them. Platinum. Now, in 2015, the 2008 to 2014 Date 8 2 died. Guys, can we get a little closer to that dial? I'll try to move physically closer. You guys try to zoom in a little bit and get the focus. So, what happened was we had one millimeter less case size with the Date 840 and a whole lot better proportions. Everything from the proportion of the magnifier to the dial to the bezel against the dial to the crown against the case was revised extensively. We also saw the debut of a new laser cut series of dials that are spectacular in their texture, which you can see right there, but also in their luminescence and luminosity. You can see that it's dynamic like a sunburst. It's what's known as the glacier blue that Rolex reserves for its platinum watches, but it has a texture and a tone and a reflective quality that is completely unique. You'll also note white gold indices, fully luminescent matching white gold hands. This is another watch that has the heart of a sports watch with the luminescence, the 100 meter water resistance, and yes, a robustly shock resistant, free sprung, full balance bridge 
with Rolex's proprietary Paraflex shock absorber. All those things, don't worry too much about what they're called, make the watch more shock resistant. Now the other feature I want to call attention to is one you can't see. Originally unveiled on the Date 8 II and Platinum, now universal to the Date 840. The pins inside the bracelet are ceramic coated to eliminate the stretching phenomenon that would cause Rolex Jubilee Oyster and President bracelets to lose their manufacturing tolerances, their tightness, and their structural integrity over time. With the ceramic coated pins, which neither wear down the platinum nor wear down in their own right, it will always remember tight, it will always essentially resemble the tight, fixed, sharp, and massive bracelet you received when you purchased it new. And of course, all of these now come with Rolex's five year warranty. What else is worth mentioning? Well, this uses the new Kroner G escapement and a larger mainspring to boost power reserve from 48 hours to 72. So yes, it's not just an aesthetic job, and it's not just about the pins and the bracelet. This is mechanically more sophisticated than what came before. All right, I can see right here, uh, Carlos T saying the ice blue Date 840 with Roman numerals might be the, better lo the best looking Date 8 ever made, aside from the legendary Stella dials. Of course, the Stella dials, the 70s and early 80s, being beautiful, rich, glossy, lacquered Date 8 dials, some of them in incredible red and green and blue tones that almost looked like enamel and had incredible depth. This new laser cut series in Glacier Blue, I would say, yeah. It's, it's a close second to that. Great comparison. Philip Hayden saying, I agree, the president makes the day date. He's not so much a fan of the oyster bracelet on the day dates. I will say this, it's a different look. And part of the challenge with Rolex is that you've balanced the brand equity of Rolex, which everyone knows, with the desire to have one that no one has. So you want the integrity of the name and the resale value it brings, but you don't want a clone watch. You don't want a copycat. You don't want to show up in the office and have the watch three other guys are sporting. So what do you do? Well, sometimes you order something like a pink dial, Roman numerals, an oyster bracelet on a day date. All of these are differentiating factors that just need to find the right buyer. So. Again, it's good to have opinions, and thanks to Rolex, we also have choice. Now, we've got a versus theme going tonight. Uh, Philip Hayden saying, best Rolex bracelet, period, the president. And also, I can see Jordan A. asking, what happened to the fabric dials? Short at Hublot, not happening these days. Okay, also, Philip B. saying, someone get Tim a jeweler's cloth. You know, that's not a bad idea right here, actually. I got myself a nice little glove. So let's, let's polish this up and get some of the fingerprints off. This is what it looks when it's all shiny. Now, I do like to present watches without gloves because I want to be unpretentious, but hey, finger oils are not attractive. Just to prove to you that it shines up swell, that's my Date 840 after attention from a microfiber glove. Good call. Okay, so now moving along, I think it's important that we talk about another in-house rivalry from another great house in Swiss watchmaking. But before I do that, I'm going to pick another winner. All right. Bum, 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 bum. Our next winner of the night is going to be Leandro Fernandez, man from Texas, down where it's considerably warmer than our blizzard conditions outdoors here. Uh, let's see. Everything's bigger in Texas. So I remember great times at Ferrari of Houston, the home base of Reese Racing. Also, the namesake of a limited edition Hublot Ferrari Big Bang. This is a Hublot Ferrari hat for you, Leandro. The next time you go and you browse the wares at the Le Mans winning Risi Racing Headquarters at Ferrari of Houston. Congratulations, Leandro. You're a second winner of the night. I'm going to be sending this out to you. Okay. We've got plenty of stuff left to win tonight, guys, including a very, very sharp Panerai Italian leather wallet and a Grand Seiko hat. Okay, moving along through our wares of the evening, I'm going to take another great house, Omega, and two alternative Seamaster chronographs, both special editions, both with a sporting bent. Let's start with the one that I can identify with more immediately and chronologically the first one to be issued. Now in 2015, Omega the official partner of Emirates Team New Zealand in America's Cup 
competition, released this special series watch in grade 5 titanium. Now it's a Seamaster 300 meter coaxial chronograph with a few distinctions. First, it's not a limited edition regardless of what people write online. It was a special edition made for one year. Limited production, not limited edition. Second, you can see that the grade 5 titanium case means that even though it's 17 millimeters thick and 52 millimeters lug to lug, this 44 millimeter watch on the wrist, eyes closed, could be 40 or 41. Physically, it feels lighter than my old 41 millimeter full bracelet Bond Seamaster. The other features that really set it apart are the matte black ceramic bezel, which features polished numerals and indices, which I appreciate immensely, attention to detail and beautifully made, and a dial in a matte finish grade 5 titanium to match the tone of the case. Now there's also a classical sporting tritone. As you can see, you've got white, gray, and red shocks. And one feature that I just love is that it features a regatta style countdown aperture framing the first few minutes of the minutes register. So yes, it's a regatta timer, but it also functions as a conventional chronograph with regular seconds and regular hours in their own separate registers. And you can see ghosted above the cannon pinion, just above the hands, the letters TI, identifying the composition of the dial. And you'll even note that there's a sharp ray hot outboard that slopes down nicely from the bezel, unifying the bezel and the dial structure with its own handsome gray, white, and red shock of tritone coloration. Plus, this is the modern era of Omega, and even though you can see those evocative old skeleton-style Bond hands, you do have an all-applied index dial, not printed like my old Bond. This is a spectacular piece, beautifully detailed on both sides with a handsome logo of Emirates Team New Zealand on the back, and you'll note a gorgeous composite pattern on the underside of the strap that not only evacuates material and makes the strap more flexible and comfortable, but also nicely apes the design of the composite sails used in the sporting multi-hulls that contest America's Cup competition these days. Mechanically, it's quite refined. As you can see on the case back, it does feature the SI-14 anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. It is a coaxial. What's interesting about this one is it's a coaxial 52-hour power reserve chronograph based on the Valgrange A07, which is essentially an upsized ETA 7750 that's been converted to work with a coaxial structure, and it's the modern tri-level coaxial. Mike Michaels absolutely loves this movement, and I have to agree, tough, precise, and with an impeccable parentage, part of the mechanical superpower ETA of Grenchen. You get a handsome package on the outside with bulletproof precision timekeeping on the inside. Okay. Going back to my live chat. Remember guys, this is a live show, so I want to hear your comments on these watches, but I also want to see your questions so I can answer them. There's no better time for me than when I get to actually speak to and interact with those who make my job possible. So if you're in the live chat, chime in. Okay, um, so we see right here, the Dubuis was the first one, an easy diver, identifying the watches we've had on the table tonight. We've had the easy diver, we've had the, 50, we've had the 5070J from Paddock, we've had two date eights, a date eight forty and a traditional date eight thirty six, and now we've had the Omega Seamaster 300 meter chronograph, Emirates Team New Zealand. We're about to look at another one in just a moment. Philip Hayden saying, I can't keep track of all the Omega model lines, but that is a pretty slick looking watch. Definitely, guys. And Yahia B, greetings from Egypt, joining in. Better late than never. We're happy to have you on board. Let's take a look at our second sporting Omega chronograph of the night. Also from the Seamaster family, this is from the flagship Seamaster Planet Ocean family. Now, this is a watch namesake Michael Phelps, released for his final Olympic contention. This is a limited edition of 280 pieces celebrating Michael Phelps' 28 Olympic medals, 23 of them gold, a record setter, and an all-timer. The watch bearing his name is equally memorable. Now, the first thing that stands out here is the coloration. With the combination of striking white ceramic dial, yes, it's polished white ceramic with the same tarnish-free qualities, and gloss and depth of enamel with the blue coloration and the orange shocks. As much as I love the big blue chronograph and ceramic, I have to admit I, I do find this one more attractive. And a big part of that is the combination of the 
the gloss white with the orange and the blue. Now, it's an orange insert in rubber in the first 15 minutes of the unidirectional rotating bezel, and then the rest is a beautiful blue ceramic with liquid metal inserts. Now, you can see in profile, it has a 52 millimeter lug to lug dimension. So even though the watch is a titanic 19 millimeters thick and 45.5 millimeters wide, I can still pull this off on my wrist. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna do a quick wrist shot just to prove it's possible. Now this watch includes all the modern standards. It is a master coaxial chronometer, so it's the new Matas timing standard, tested as a fully cased up watch, not a bare COSC certified movement. This one is remarkably attractive, memorable, and how often can you say there's only 280 examples of an Omega Seamaster? If you like the line, you like the general chronograph design, but you want something a bit exclusive and special, this is a great candidate. You can see my wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference, the watch is big, but it's not overpowering to the point that I wouldn't wear it. You can see the look is large, and it's definitely a burly contender in the 45 millimeter class. But ask, would you rather have this watch for right around $7,500 or pay three or four times that much for a competitive Hublot Big Bang or Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore of comparable stance, wrist presence, and I gotta be honest, lesser mechanical sophistication than this master chronometer. 60 hour power reserve, coaxial escapement, COSC standard, and then some. This watch has twin mainspring barrels, a vertical clutch, and a column wheel architecture, and it's water resistant and shock resistant and anti-magnetic to an extent that no AP or Hublot, even with the in-house calibers, can pretend to be technically sophisticated, aesthetically memorable, and a rare instance of an Omega Seamaster that's also exclusive. For me, I have to be honest, I like the Emirates Team New Zealand better. It's the combination of the grayscale with the shocks of red and that matte titanium dial that really set this one apart for me. Guys, can we go back to the macro on that? I wanna do a quick side-by-side -side just to show you what I'm thinking of right here. These are very special watches, but for me, this is an all-the-time watch. This is just discreet enough that you could pull it off in an office. This is the kind of thing that Michael Phelps perhaps could wear to the office. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to occupy the corner office if you're wearing this one to work because it makes one hell of a statement for an everyday timepiece. Maybe a little bit too much visibility. Now I will say, if you wanna fly under the radar, uh, this isn't so much a versus as a brief alliance of convenience between two great names from the same house, separated by about nine years of production. Now, you can see with the Easy Diver chronograph that it's sort of a nightmare scale tribute to the original Roger Dubuis sympathy case. You can definitely see the lineage, but you can't necessarily see the delicacy and elegance of the original. So this versus is a question of which generation of the case you prefer and which generation of Roger Dubuis. Now here's the thing, this case design was originally conceived by one of Dubuis contractors, a case maker in the Valley du Jeu. This right here was designed by Dubuis' business partner, Carlos Diaz, in the early 2000s. This right here has a spectacular bi-retrograde design to the calendar system with a, with a moon phase that essentially makes it a loving tribute to Dubuis' era of collaboration, not so much with Patek, but with Harry Winston as Dubuis and Jean-Marc Vidrecht in 1989, Vidrecht later of Agenor, which for instance makes the Singer Track 1 chronograph. They created this retrograding complication display back then for the very first Harry Winston high horology watch, and it lives on in the sympathy case here, 34.5 millimeters. Now this design was conceived in about 2005. You can see this one was a millennial limited edition. Uh, what sets this watch part is the delicacy and the elegance, but also the shaped sapphire. If we could go back to the macro, the original versions of this watch were built with a case, a sapphire, and a bezel that all featured that tortured, drawn, fluid form. And it was incredibly difficult to make to the point that Dubuis eventually gave up on it and just started making the sympathy models in this case with a regular round bezel and round sapphire. This is the one I prefer. It's also the less common of the two designs. These are now collectible pieces as this watch, once an absolute steel pre-owned, now retails for a respectable on the pre-owned circuit about $19,900. Geneva Hallmark and a Besson chronometer 
you can see it actually says Bulletin d'Observatoire. It's a Bulletin d'Observatoire chronometer by virtue of the French Besançon Observatory, a glorious horological tradition on which Roger Dubuis himself insisted when obtaining both Geneva Hallmark and chronometer certificate for these early watches. I can see right here, Todd Piasecki saying, great omegas tonight, awesome verses so far. Matt Foster asking, how big is that sympathy on the wrist? That's a great question. I'm going to show you this 34.5 millimeter sympathy on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. I feel like this is a watch that has so much personality. It, it reads as a classically sized watch, but because of the strength of the lugs, which splay out and really express themselves as full forms, this is a watch that I would say wears aesthetically like a 37 or a 38 with the strength of the lugs being a differentiating factor that makes the watch read as larger than it is on the wrist. I believe even if you have a larger wrist, if you're into watches like 37 millimeter Patek Philippe, this is exactly up your alley. If you like anything smaller than a 40 millimeter dress watch, this is a perfect match. And yes, I understand for those of you who are microfiber devotees and can't stand the look of unsheathed hands. Let me polish this one up and do it some justice with a clean shot. Absent oils. Absolutely glorious. And I'll also say, Dubuis back then used what was distinctly a 5N red gold alloy. Not pink, not rolled gold. Beautiful. Okay. Right here, uh, Andrew WST saying, I saw the Pirelli version of the new Dubuis at an authorized dealer. Very impressive. Uh, he's not a fan, he says, but he, he's impressed by the quality. I'd agree with that. The direction the brand has gone has been very controversial. In some ways, Dubuis wants to be the Genevois Richard Mille. What Richard Mille is to the oversized sports watch, Dubuis wants to be that with the Geneva Hallmark. And thus, they're forging into the same brands that you see Richard Mille typically associate with. Richard Mille is associated with McLaren, so Dubuis is going to associate with Lamborghini and Pirelli. It makes sense. And in terms of product quality, I will say that Dubuis is at least where Richard Mille is, maybe even a little bit better in finishing across the board, as many RM calibers are rather industrial in their execution. But why don't we let the product speak for itself? Because tonight on the table, I've got a face-off between two high horology brands doing ultra-thin watches in the Haute de Gamme range. Now, what you're looking at here is my all-time favorite Richard Mille. This is the one I'd buy for myself in a beautiful satin finished titanium. This is the RM16 Extra Flat. From 2007, Richard Mill responded to his customers who said, I love the look of the watch. I love the technical aesthetic. I love everything the brand stands for in terms of image and engineering, but I need to be able to wear it with a suit, not just in terms of the look, but in terms of the wrist clearance. The height above the wrist for the tonneau shaped cases was just too tall. So Richard Mill cut it down to 8.5 millimeters in girth. Very slim, only 50 millimeters lug to lug. You can wear this watch easily on a tiny wrist. I would say down to 14 and a half centimeters, you're going to wear it easily because of the camber of the case that wraps around your wrist. It's 38 millimeters wide, and what I love is that they really sweated the details. If you look at the case back, you can see that they actually scalloped and cut out the sapphire to create a circular recess for the winding mass so that it could actually be countersunk into the plane of the sapphire. So the sapphire actually frames the winding mass with a razor slim sapphire sliver actually separating your wrist from the variable inertia winding rotor. Now why do you have a variable inertia winding rotor? You can see these, these winglets on both sides that can be moved in and out. Well it's because the RMAS 7 caliber features a mechanism by which you can increase or decrease the polar moment of the rotor. So if you're very active you may want to decrease the activity of the winding mass to reduce wear and tear on the winding system. Whereas if you're very inert you want to increase the polar moment so that it's more likely to rotate and wind the watch while well, you spend your time 
in desk adventures typing away on your keyboard like I do. That's why you have the variable inertia rotor that your watchmaker, your Richard Mill watchmaker, can set for you. Separately, you'll note that the movement, the RMAS-7, features twin mainspring barrels. It's based on a Valchet manufacturer, a Bausch, but the modifications include full titanium construction of the bridges and the plates, skeletonization, and if you look at the corners, it's mounted on elastomer shock absorbers. Let me show you this. The, the, the mounting screws on the corners actually signify where basically rubber shock absorbers provide shock protection for this ultra-thin caliber. So modified heavily, Richard Neal makes the RMAS-7 its own. And on the dial side, you can see multiple sapphires. The first covers the watch. The second acts as a base for the numerals that you see on the dial side. And then the final one, if you get really close, the final sapphire is actually a sapphire date disc that peeks out and replaces the seven o'clock numeral. You can actually see there's a small date, and that is a transparent sapphire against a white base, and it actually circles the dial. It only becomes visible at that point. Titanium and ultra-thin with a ceramic crown. This is a handsome and versatile watch. It's one of the very few Richard Mill timepieces that I say you can wear for anything from ice spelunking to your daughter's wedding. And let me give you a wrist shot. This one's mounted on a Richard Mill rubber strap. So this is what it looks like if you wear the RM16 extra flat on your wrist. Okay. So you're looking at it on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's got a wide stance, but note how much of that width across my wrist is actually the strap flaring out. So you can neck this down to, I believe, a 14 and a half centimeter circumference wrist. It wears absolutely slim. You can see my wrist bones getting in the way a bit. That's a better, that's a better impression of the case and how it sits. Absolutely no issues clearing a cuff. It's not excessively large, but it does have the wrist presence to impress. It's a thin watch, not an anonymous watch. So if you're into Richard Mille, originally retailing for about 55,000, you can get it for about 44,000 pre-owned. And I think this one's a great buy, a lovely piece. But what do we compare to this? Versus is the theme. So versus what, Richard Mille? Well, let's take another upstart independent, possibly the only brand that has the same cachet and independent scene chic image. I, I would say, it doesn't get any more competitive than F.P. Journe. Sports chic in its own way. This is the Octoloon in 42 millimeters. Now, historically, F.P. Journe was a 38 millimeter round case. Stepped up to 40, ultimately phased out the 38 and added 42 across the range in 2015. This watch is scaled up in every way. It's not just a bigger case. What I need to emphasize is that the date is bigger, the moon phase aperture is bigger, the sweep of the power reserve is larger, and the dial itself is bigger. Even the crown has been scaled up for the 42 millimeter case. So it's not simply a matter of expanding everything out. Unlike those chronographs that use pathetically undersized movements and wind up with bizarrely mangled visual details on the dial to disguise that, this watch has been properly scaled up in every respect so that on a big risk, it reads as proportionally identical to the 40 or the 38 on a small wrist. So let me give you a wrist impression of, of a 42 millimeter F.P. Journe. This is the new look at F.P. Journe. 42, fabulous in platinum. You'll note one quality of this watch that sets it apart from the other 42s is that it is the black label. So you can only buy this if you can prove that you are an original owner of a new F.P. Journe. So you can't just go out and buy a pre-owned and then get on the wait list. Moreover, each F.P. Journe boutique and espace is limited to ordering 10 total black label watches per year and only two of any given model per espace or boutique. So how many boutiques are we talking? There are about nine F.P. Journe boutiques right now. I think they just closed Boca. So there are nine total, each of which could order two of these per year. That's the kind of exclusivity we're talking about. Now, 42 millimeters and completely platinum means it's a hefty watch. A full 18 karat rose gold movement adds additional mass. Now I've held an F.P. Journe movement blank in my hand. It's like holding a gold dollar coin, like an old California gold dollar coin in your hand. And 
it's not just massive, but when it's finally a movement, it's beautiful. Note three different finishes. You've got barley corn or Grand Dorge on the winding mass, cut with a rose lathe. You've got circular Cote de Genève across the bridges, perfectly aligned. And then you've got a beautiful and even engine turned, let me turn that the other way, engine turned perlage on the base plate. Now if we can get really close to this, guys, you'll see that not only is there a petite perlage, but if you look just above it on the base plate outside the scope of the balance, there's a large perlage. Beautifully executed, you get your money's worth with an FP Journe. And though the complication is simple, remember, you're getting a five-day power reserve, so this is ideal for those who have multiple watches and like to rotate through multiple different looks. So you can ultimately declare both the winners in the contest between Richard Mille and F.P. Journe. The RM16 Extra Thin, or Extra Flat as they call it, for those times when you get, want to get a little bit wild and boisterous, and those times when you need to tone it down or maybe just add sophistication, the F.P. Journe. I think they complement each other. Let's pick another winner. Brian Duffy saying, that is a piece of heaven. AP Royalty saying, he wishes F.P. Journe still had the 38. They live forever on the pre-owned market, guys. Watch box for all your discontinued, rare, collectible, vintage, and pre-owned watch buying, trading, and selling needs. Okay, and Russell996 saying FP rocks. Mike K saying hard to beat Langa, but Jorn is great. Brian Duffy said, I never got a notification. I hate being late. I'm sorry about that. I'll see what's up with our settings. I'll try to fix that. All right, let's pick a winner. Go into my email. Our third winner of the night is going to be Brad Boyle, Brad of, of Canada. See, I love my friends from the Great White North. You can win if you're not in the United States. You're gonna win a Grand Seiko hat. I'm guessing that if it's blizzard conditions here in Philadelphia, it must be downright bone chilling in Canada right now. So I'm gonna keep your head warm. I can't take care of the rest of you, but I've got you set at least with a cap for your top this winter in Canada. Brad, congratulations. We've still got a spectacular Italian blue leather Panerai wallet to give away tonight, guys. So if you're just joining me, mail to Tim at thewatchbox.com your name, your phone number, and your physical mailing address so I can send you for free, shipping included, free stuff. All right, moving along, let's continue our versus theme and let's talk about a brand that we hardly ever mention on this show or watch reviews. This is Mont Blanc. Now, Mont Blanc makes some wonderful things, but you rarely ever hear about the watches that aren't part of the Villeray or Minerva collection. Yes, what's made in Villeray at Minerva is spectacular, but they also have a manufacturer in La Loque, Switzerland, where the manufacturer caliber Nicholas Riasek chronograph is made. Now this is the Nicholas Riasek as we first saw it in 2008 with a spectacular combination of a dual time function and a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph with a unique scrolling seconds and minutes register. I absolutely love that display. I also like the flanking day-night indicator and the, the way the second time zone is arrayed centrally. Now here's the thing. You turn the watch over and it's just as appealing on the back. No, we're not talking Minerva finish, but it's darn sharp. You can see a couple of features that stand out. First, through the skeletonized winding mass, you can see the polished column wheel. Second, you can see at the base of the caliber, a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance. This is bleeding edge technology that you want to see on a watch. When you can get that watch for under $8,000 pre-owned with an original retail of about thirteen grand, you are talking about getting a substantial discount on something that costs new about what you'd pay for a Rolex Daytona and gives you far more technology and capability in the form of that second time zone and a unique display. You're also getting twin mainspring barrels for even timekeeping throughout the entirety of the 68 hour power reserve of this 43 millimeter stainless steel chronograph. So as a value proposition, this mono pusher is one mean customer. Okay, so now what would I compare to that? What's our versus against that? Well, I would say realistically, we're gonna go with High Horology and we're gonna go with another brand that doesn't get nearly enough mention, especially when we're not talking about its flagship product, the 50 Fathoms. This is the Blanc Paul Le Mans flyback chronograph. So it's 40 millimeters with a spectacular tritone white, red, and black dial that actually has a combination of black and anthracite. You can see it is a satin finished 40 millimeter double gadron bezel titanium case. It features a gorgeous 
rubber-coated leather strap that's both handsome and feels spectacular against the wrist, and it's matched with a full deployant clasp to gather up any excess length and tuck it underneath with a minderless system so that there are no minder loops on the strap. Now this is 100 meters water resistant, so whereas the Mont Blanc has complication in the form of the second time zone, this watch has sophistication in the form of its hand-finished F-185 caliber and durability in the form of its 100 meter water resistance. The Mont Blanc is water resistant to 30 meters, splash and rain only. Now this is a beautiful dial at night that is robustly luminescent. It glows like an absolute torch. You would mistake it for a 50 fathoms. Now it is a flyback chronograph, so once you start this one up and let me liberate its chronograph pusher so I can demonstrate the mechanism. But once you start this one up, you have the ability to time two events in rapid succession, restarting and resetting all in one push of the reset trigger at four o'clock. This is a rare piece. Launched in the late 2000s and discontinued in the early 2010s, you scarcely ever see it. Perfectly sized, perfectly detailed, perfectly proportioned with a true high horology movement. I wish Blancpain would go back to making watches like this. The L Evolution was a, mis a misstep. The Lamborghini thing did not fit, but you know what? It's not too late. Swatch Group, if you're spending money on any of your premium brands besides Omega and Breguet these days, show some love to Blancpain. Let's get a look at this. 40 millimeters on the 16 centimeter circumference wrist. You can see this is old school Blancpain. This is Jean-Claude Biver back before he got all big and all bang. Absolutely timeless. This will look just as good 50 years hence. Again, before he was King Power, Jean-Claude Biver was a classicist. And frankly, if you look at what the man himself collects, it's a lot more in this vein than Hublot Ferrari, as much as we love them. All right. Bump, 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 bump. Back to our live chat, questions and comments. I can see we've got a lot of friends joining us tonight. I see Mike K saying, hard to take Mont Blanc seriously after that FP Journe. True, but the difference is going to be a few tens of thousands of dollars. If you could have that Mont Blanc for $7,000 versus the FP Journe for forty-two grand, there's a case to be made there for the Blanc Pont, the Mont Blanc, the Zenith on the table tonight, and the other watches that don't cost as much as a large boat. Okay, so again, the Blanc Pont under eight grand. That's a lot of watch for the money. And we're talking about the Rolex Daytona as a point of reference tonight. The Rolex Daytona retails for about 12,500 in steel ceramic. That Blanc Pont retailed for 13,000. Under eight grand for me, that's the buy. And with no wait list, unlike the Rolex. Okay, Manny Manster saying, shout out, I subscribe. Manny M, shout out, and thank you for your subscription. Simon Holt saying, the Blanc Paul looks great at that size. I agree, at that size and with the satin titanium, it's perfect. More of this, please, Blanc Paul. Also, I like watches saying, I was looking at the 38 millimeter Le Mans flyback, a very nice watch, also in its own right. A little bit more classical, 40 millimeter, I think, for the modern connoisseur, has a more universal appeal. And Fjord Prefix saying, screw down pushers, always a plus, they inspire confidence. A push down crown and 100 meter water resistance, not everyone trusts that. I appreciate the screw down here. Also, um, Victor saying, JCB collects Patek Philippe. This is a fact. All right, moving on. Let's take a look at a watch we haven't mentioned from a brand we absolutely love here at Watchbox. Let's say you got $2,500 to spend on a dive watch. You don't want to compromise in quality. You want a distinctive look, superb capability, and something no one else has. How about a tungsten bezel depth gauge dive watch from Oris? This is the Oris Aquas depth gauge. 46 millimeters in black DLC with a tungsten carbide, virtually indelible bezel insert. This watch is so wearable despite its size that I'm gonna put it on my wrist immediately to show you what I'm talking about. 46 millimeters, but only 54 millimeters from lug to lug. If you can wear a 44 millimeter Panerai Luminor, you can wear this. They're the same measurement lug to lug. Now the watch is thick, but not as thick as you might imagine. 15 millimeters thick instead of the 17 or 19 of those Omegas. And you've got a depth gauge on the dial. Let me show you how it works. 
So of course you've seen the Jager Le Coult Master World Geographic with its mechanical depth gauge. You've seen the Panerai Pam 193, for example, with the same. Actually, they use an electronic system at Panerai that needs a battery. And you've seen the IWC Deep Series. Well, here you've got an aperture at 12 o'clock in the crystal, and then you've got a tube that literally traces the arc of the dial down to the calibration 100. That's for 100 meters. So you have a meniscus-based indicator that uses water pressure and the countervailing air pressure in the tube to indicate via the water's meniscus point what depth you're at. Rock solid, it even features a micro adjuster in the clasp and it's a full trigger actuated clasp, not a clamshell and not friction fit. What I also love is unlike Breitling's setup with dive watches, you don't have to cut it. It features an adjustability system with perforations so you don't have to worry about buying a new strap if you decide to sell the watch or give it as a gift. You simply size it and you keep the whole strap you bought in the first place. It also features a lovely vanilla scent to the strap, so while the strap looks good and it feels good, you may not know this from the video, but it also smells good. That's $2,500. That's a ton of watch for the money from a brand that is private, family owned, has been around and will be around. Oris of Holstein. Oh, right. And Victor S. saying, it looks like a 42 millimeter and it's perfect value for the money. I agree. And Hell Bob saying, that Oris is a cool watch for the price. Yes, it is. And again, for two and a half thousand dollars, it leaves a lot of money in the bank to spread the f to spread the love essentially around our table. But this is versus tonight, so we don't want love; we want adversity. What could we possibly compare at this point? Well, we've seen one big black sports watch. Let's make a no comparison test between the Oris for two and a half grand and Jager Le Coult, another big 46 millimeter black cased watch. Now this watch pre-owned is just under $12,000. This version came out at SIHH 2016. It's a combination of black ceramic, matte black ceramic, and rose gold. It is a very handsome combination. The other feature that I love is that it's also a dual time. So let me see if I can engage the, oh, there it is. There it is, you have a GMT chronograph. So while I rarely use a chronograph, you can see the dual time you can use all the time. Are you traveling? Are you keeping track of friends, far-flung family, or business associates? Well, you have the dual time system when you need it. When you don't, you simply back up that travel time hand underneath the primary hour hand, superimpose them, and it cleans up the dial. Now, the other thing I love about this watch is that it's JLC's in-house caliber 750 series. So you have a 65 hour power reserve via twin mainspring barrels, the master 1000 hours control test of a fully cased up watch, not just the movement, 100 meter water resistance in this case, thanks to the wonderful compressor crown system that's becoming an endangered species in the JLC catalog. Red you're dead, one half a turn, white you're tight. It's that simple, there's no screw down mechanism, it's easy to manipulate, eyes closed, even with wet hands, even with gloved hands. It doesn't get any better for sports watches than the original compressor crown system. The dial is robustly luminescent, glows like a torch at night, and thanks to the matte black finishing, there is no glare. You'll even see that there's a small AM PM indicator, a day night indicator, just below the marquee above the hands, and yes, a discrete jump date. And unlike many quick adjust systems with GMT watches that force you to advance the hand in order to advance the date, there's a quick set for both the reference hour hand and for the date. Separate quick sets, I like that feature. Free sprung, very robust, unidirectional winding with ceramic rotor bearings, all the modern tech in a watch that you can buy, yes, for the price of a new Rolex Daytona with no wait list. I love this piece. Personally, I would go with the blue accented version, but the rose gold is richer. And I must say, friends from my old neck of the woods, Miami Beach, or my dream location, the Sunset Strip in LA, would absolutely dig this version of the watch. Great value there, and a wonderful brand with a wonderful reference. JLC, we need more master compressors. What's up? Bring them back. Okay, I can also see uh, we have Solid SN 2011 saying, Tim, if you ever get the chance, I would love to see a review of the VC Historique Corn Davache 1955. So would I. When that watch lands, and it will, you'll see the, re you'll see the review here. 
I could probably see any conceivable version of that land on my desk, from recently pre-owned and precious metal to the steel version that Hodenki sold. So keep your eyes peeled. When the review comes, it'll be right here on this channel, Watchbox Reviews. By the way, guys, if you haven't subscribed, please do. We love to chat with our subscribers. We love to see returning viewers to our broadcasts, and I always interact in the descriptions below, uh, in the comment fields below the videos I post, and not just watch as live. All right, I see uh, Fjord Prefix saying that the rose gold looks a little bit out of place on that watch. It might be. To those who prefer white metal and dark cases, or matte finishes and low key, but it is a 46 millimeter sports watch. Who are we fooling? Whether it's rose gold or base metal, that's a watch that stands out. Okay, so let's put a bow on this with two competitive dark gray dial chronographs for accessible real world money. Now, I like to say that I go from A to Z, often Audemars to Zenith with these watches tonight, but we're actually gonna be talking about not so much the Alpha and the Omega, but the Omega and the Zulu. We're gonna be talking about the Zenith El Primero, 36,000 vibration per hour classic cars for $5,950 pre-owned, and the Omega DeVille Coaxial Retropont for $5,950 pre-owned. Now the watch you're looking at in my hand right here came out in 2005. 52 hour power reserve, double column wheel, vertical clutch. This is the caliber 3312. You can see it's nicely decorated for an Omega. It's based on the one, the 1286 Bausch made by Frederic Piguet. You can see it's free sprung. You can see that it is a chronometer. It is coaxial. It has not one, but two separate visible column wheels operating the split second mechanism with 100 meter water resistance. Throw this one on a water resistant band and this could be your only watch for splish and splash wherever you may be this winter when you go on vacation or in the summer to come. Also note the unconventional use of perlage across all of the bridges. It's absolutely gorgeous with blued screws to boot. Now on the dial side, the watch features a spectacular split second readout. Now you can see the split second allows me to time two separate concurrent events and then continue to time them in real time with two separate split seconds hands. You can also see that this is a complex dial with applied indices that are incredibly handsome, beautiful Asagai or spear style luminescent hands at center and the first use of a triple aperture date that I can recall in the luxury watch space. The idea being that even if the date is covered by the minute hand, you can see the succeeding and the preceding number so you know the correct date at any given time. There's a beautiful dark ruthenium coat that gives this one a lot of character and you can see that it has the stepped case design inspired by the 1950s reference, I wanna say it was 2736. Beautiful, exclusive, rare, handsome, and from a brand like Omega that'll be around to service it forever, peace of mind inducing. From another top shelf brand for exactly the same price, only one half millimeter difference in case side, but separated by 11 years of Basel Worlds, 2016 saw Zenith launch for the first time ever a dark ruthenium dial that featured a Cote de Genève on the dial side. And this was the first time a base metal was available with both the Cote de Genève dial and the dark ruthenium. This is the El Primero. 36,000 vibration per hour classic cars special edition. Not limited edition, but limited production. It's 42 millimeters in stainless steel with a gorgeous box section sapphire that must have been awfully expensive to make and a handsome beveled case design with satin and polish that will stand the test of time. What's also stood the test of time is this tritone triple register. And for 2016, Zenith finally fixed the problem with their modern versions of this register allowing you to read all indications of chronograph hours and minutes despite the register overlap. You'll also note the diamond polished and applied indices giving an upscale sheen to this already special dial and outboard a tachymeter scale because this is a car themed watch so you can time an object and gauge its speed over a standard kilometer or mile. Now here's the thing, this is a non-denominational car watch. So if you're put off by watches that are car themed with explicit branding, this watch has no explicit branding other than Zenith and El Primero. Now this watch is also 100 meters water resistant, so it's just as versatile as the Omega. What sets it apart? Well, instead of a retropont system, it uses a high beat chronograph that 
has 10 beats per second and is able to resolve one tenth of a second when timing your favorite automobile at your favorite race. This is a handsome piece no longer cataloged and dearly missed. Note the attention to detail. The watch, in addition to its many dial distinctions, features separate colored rings in recesses on the chronograph pushers, as you can see black and red, and you can see a handsome, beautifully double-crested calfskin perforated leather strap designed to evoke upholstery and vintage driving gloves from the classic period of mid-century motoring, the, the likes of which you might see while motoring in a vintage Porsche 356, Mercedes-Benz 300 SL, Jaguar XKE, or heck, why not, a Stingray Corvette. It also comes with a full deployant clasp, so Zenith was not pinching pennies with the specification of this watch, now available for under $6,000. Now, even if you're not opting in for one of these watches, you can still opt in to our raffle and our giveaway. And I'm going to pick our last winner of this watch's live. Okay, tonight, bum ba bum ba bum, bum Our final winner for the evening will be Andre's N. Andre N, welcome and thank you. You're joining our family with a Panerai wallet. Italian, blue, leather, exclusive, awesome, and now yours. All right, Andre N, thank you so much. Guys, everyone who joined, everyone who chimed in, everyone who participated, everyone who commented, Simon Holt saying, come to the Goodwood Revival soon, Tim. That'll be a pilgrimage I must make, to be continued. Until then, this is Watches Live. This was Vertz's. They're the crew. We're expecting a snow out tomorrow, so we won't be in live, but we're going to have content going live at 6 all the same. Thanks again. We're Watchbox, and thanks for logging on.